What is the history of morality and what are its effects on our ways of life? I am Rodrigo Gim, an anthropologist and social critic, and this is Critique with Nietzsche and Foucault. The Genealogy of Morals is an 1887 book by the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Today I will continue the series with the fifth video about the third essay of the book. The third essay is entitled, What is the Meaning of Ascetic Ideals? And Nietzsche starts by making a strong affirmation regarding will, because human will needs a goal, and says Nietzsche, it will rather will nothingness than not will at all. The will to nothingness linked to the ascetic ideal shows up in many forms, in the will to truth included. The search for the in itself of things is a metaphysical will to truth that Nietzsche will critique in the third essay of the book. For those moved by ascetic ideals, truth comes from above, from beyond, from anywhere but from real life. The senses are always mischievous, the body only a vehicle for the soul. Suffering, torture, pain become vehicles for the ascetic idealists, and all that makes life hard become signs to their affirmation of themselves as worthy, as having any value, and their value comes from the release from suffering, through abnegation, self-torture, and the slandering of life itself. Metaphysical philosophers slander life in order to affirm only their existence as philosophers. They don't negate all existence because it is only their existence that they affirm, no matter how debased and sick of life itself they have become. Nietzsche not only negates ascetic ideals like poverty, humility, and even chastity. It is the idealism of the uses of these that he critiques. One may become strong because of poverty. One may make uses of certain doses of humility so as not to become so certain of truth. And one may make uses of chastity for a time in order to gather productive artistic energy, for example. What Nietzsche critiques in the ascetic ideals is that they are founded on metaphysics. They still believe in the one truth that guides everyone and everything. They believe so much in truth that they have even become wary of using the word. However, those who employ ascetic ideals do so from an unquestioned belief in truth. And truth comes with its double for dominant culture even today, and this double is morality. Says Nietzsche, citation, All good things were formerly bad things. Every original sin has turned into an original virtue. The gentle, benevolent, conciliatory, and compassionate feelings, and here Nietzsche is of course alluding to Christian moral values, and he continues, eventually so highly valued that they almost constitute the eternal values, were opposed for the longest time by self-contempt. One was ashamed of mildness as one is today ashamed of hardness. End of citation. So here Nietzsche points to a fact of culture, that it is not only about reproduction. Cultures do not only reproduce themselves. They also involve processes of self-overcoming. And ascetic ideals have been a greater part of this self-overcoming. Philosophy came about as a form of self-overcoming of the religious type. Says Nietzsche, citation, The philosophic spirit always had to use as a mask and cocoon the previously established types of the contemplative man, priest, sorcerer, soothsayer, and in any case a religious type, in order to be able to exist at all. 
The ascetic ideal for a long time served the philosopher as a form in which to appear, as a precondition of existence. He had to represent it so as to be able to be a philosopher. He had to believe in it in order to be able to represent it. The peculiar, withdrawn attitude of the philosopher, world-denying, hostile to life, suspicious of the senses, freed from sensuality, which has been maintained down to the most modern times and has become virtually the philosopher's pose par excellence. It is above all a result of the emergency conditions under which philosophy arose and survived at all. For the longest time, philosophy would not have been possible at all on earth without ascetic wraps and cloak without an ascetic self-misunderstanding. End of citation. So here Nietzsche shows how we can think of ascetic ideals as historic without judging them, but looking at their effects, one of which was to make philosophy possible. Philosophy as in construct, as not one thing that traverses history, but actually as part of history itself. Philosophers came, in part, from the ascetic priests. Through differentiation, however, many philosophers have a lot in common with ascetic priests in their treatment of life as a mistake. The ascetic priests act from resentment, from a will against life, says Nietzsche, citation. Here, an attempt is made to employ force to block up the wells of force. End of citation. The ascetic priest wants to deny his own reality in the name of the one reality, a reality that is outside of his own reality. That is why it can show up as a will to nothingness, a will to a pure, willless, painless, timeless, knowing subject. Nothing is farther from Nietzsche's philosophical method. Nietzsche, contrary to the metaphysical idealism of the one truth about anything, sees that having more perspectives and more affects allow one to have an intellect more immersed in life. Objectivity, this canon of ascetic ideals, is a problem for Nietzsche because it claims to see more when it actually sees less. Nietzsche claims for another kind of objectivity. He says, citation, There is only a perspective seeing, only a perspective knowing, and the more affects we allow to speak about one thing, the more eyes, different eyes, we can use to observe one thing, the more complete will our concept of this thing, our objectivity be. End of citation. You see here that Nietzsche is not saying that there is no reality, there is no objectivity. He questions on what grounds, from what kind of approach, one claims to be objective. If one seeks detachment, impartiality, neutrality, if one seeks, like the ascetic priest, to get away from life, to be in a different place, then one is a denier, but then one is also a bridge for others, for the herd to feel represented. So in this sense, a life denier is also a force of life. The ambiguity of the ascetic priest is this. He is a denier of life, but at the same time, a force of life. In this, there is no morality. Nietzsche's critique is a critique beyond good and evil morality and beyond the metaphysical will to truth. His critique aims at the modes of life that sustain a will to truth and a will to power, and what these modes of life say about these wills, and not the reverse. The value of a will to truth and of a will to power lies in the lives that are lived and not in themselves. There is nothing in itself for Nietzsche. That he leaves to Kant and other metaphysical thinkers. Every ascetic priest directs resentment. He is a director of resentment. He points to the enemy, to another that is to blame for one's feeling sick or suffering. 
He also points to the herd and summons all of his sheep to feel ashamed of themselves, to feel guilty. And guilt is instituted as that never-ending state of being human. Human, the sinner, bad conscience is the birth of conscience. So it is also the birth of herd mentality. Says Nietzsche, citation. The formation of a herd is a significant victory and advance in the struggle against depression. With the growth of the community, a new interest grows for the individual too and often lifts him above the most personal element in his discontent, his aversion to himself. End of citation. So what the ascetic priest does is to provide the conditions for the anesthesia of pain, to provide, says Nietzsche, this kind of medication which does not aim at curing the sickness, but at combating the depression by relieving and deadening its displeasure. End of citation. So the ascetic priest is providing relief, but in a way that deepens the sickness as well. It is a kind of relief because it provides meaning, but it is meaning that only moves the servitude of the sick animal further. The ascetic priest forces the sick human to understand his pain as punishment, or as Nietzsche says, the reinterpretation of suffering as feelings of guilt, fear, and punishment. End of citation. The ascetic ideal is dangerous because it believes in only one goal, and at the same time, it believes in its superiority over every other power, every other truth, because for it, there is not even an other truth. There is only one truth. In this sense, modern science is one of the inheritors of the ascetic ideal when it claims to speak for reality, to have only one goal, the goal of uncovering the real, the one and only truth. As much as the ascetic ideal that tries to keep busy do the work of God or, or, or of truth, modern science also may be that when it is a means of self-narcosis, a looking away from oneself in order not to look back at oneself. Science also as a means to not deal with life, to construct another life because one cannot bear living. Science and its negation of religious doctrine reveals then some, something much more underlying. Its aspirations to substitute for religion is practical and feasible because scientists still have faith in truth. Says Nietzsche, citation, The will to truth requires a critique. Let us thus define our own task. The value of truth must for once be experimentally called into question. End of citation. This calling Nietzsche makes about experimentally questioning the value of truth is taken forward by Foucault, who studied the relations between truths and practices of the self, as well as institutional practices. Nietzsche didn't see science as able to question truth enough, because, because it also suffers dominantly and not universally, of course, from an overestimation of truth. For him, art could provide a more important way to counter the overestimation of truth. However, he also valued critical thought, which is an important part of science, and he played with the notion of an artistic uh, Socrates, for example. Nietzsche's thought is not essentialistic. There is no science in itself, there is no art in itself, there is always a multiplicity at play. Science, history, art, philosophy, what are their values? In themselves, they are nothingness, because they need their operators, their creators, to provide values. They are far from being mirrors to life. And what is a mirror if not always a reverse and distorted image? We never just describe things. We act and our actions can deceive as inactions, but only when living on too much nihilism. Even nihilism can be productive. The history of dominant Christian culture 
is a history of nihilistic self-overcoming. Says Nietzsche, citation, All great things bring about their own destruction through an act of self-overcoming. In this way, Christianity as a dogma was destroyed by its own morality. In the same way, Christianity as morality must now perish too. We stand on the threshold of this event. After Christian truthfulness has drawn one inference after another, it must end by drawing its most striking inference, its inference against itself. This will happen, however, when it poses the question, what is the meaning of all will to truth? As the will to truth thus gains self-consciousness, there can be no doubt about that. Morality will gradually perish now. End of citation. To experiment with and to question the will to truth, a task not just for philosophers, but a necessary practice of ourselves while morality fades away. Well, people, that's it for the third and last essay of the book. Hope you liked this series. And of course, we have no intention here of talking about all that Nietzsche said in the book, because we make our choices and interpretations. Please support my work on Patreon if you can, subscribe to the channel, and see you next week.